All right, well, welcome um, <clears throat> to, to the first of a series of Centro webinars. Um, Centro has um, developed a program for this year um, of webinars, which, which are aimed at um, introducing local participants in South African labor market debates um, to, the, um, to international developments particularly around um, issues of the scope of, of employment law, definitions of work and, and related issues such as platform work. Um, we're very pleased that our, our first speaker is, is uh, Lord John Hendy QC, um, one of Britain's foremost um, employment law barristers and a, a, a Labour nominated member of the House of Lords who's been involved in, in the development of the Status of Workers Bill. John has just circulated to, to participants I see, and um, we had circulated it earlier. It is, I think, a very creative and imaginative response to the, uh, the rise of, of informal work and, and of uh, the increasing move of work outside of formal labor protection. And I think it, it is a very, um, important um, reminder of the possibilities of, of, of the form um, regulation could, could take. Um, I've known John for many years. Um, we met many years ago in our respective roles of representing our country's um, National Union of Mine Workers. Um, you'll see from the program that he's, you know, he's, he's a council of deep experience that done matters of, of major import particularly around the impact of, of international labor standards on UK law. And, um, you know, I, I think the, um, this debate around the concept of, of the state of, of, of a universal status of work applicable um, to, to all labor legislation is, is something that really will trigger, um, you know, debates in this country. So, so with that, um, over to you, um, John. Um, thanks very much for, for addressing our seminar. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for the kind introduction and the honor of being the first speaker in this uh, series of uh, seminars. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna speak principally about the status of workers bill, which uh, is currently well, I'll, I'll come to that, but it, it uh, obviously formed in the, par the British Parliament. Um, let, let me begin with the with the uh, how the bill came came about and where it is now. Um, it's a private members' bill, which means to say that I, as a backbencher in the House of Lords, introduced it. But I got the chance to do so by reason that whenever Parliament. Um, begins each session of parliament they have a ballot for private members bills and uh, i was lucky enough to draw a uh, um the, the ba a ballot for that bill in my in my first um, go because i've only been been there a couple of uh, years so i chose to do it on the status of workers the downside of this is that parliament has been pro prorogued last week and another session begins on the 10th of May, which means that my bill, which was successful in all stages through the House of Lords and was uh, until the prorogation in the House of Commons where it received its first reading, uh, that bill now falls. So um, I'm gonna chance my arm and put it in for the ballot for the uh, for the next uh, group of private members' bills, and see if I can progress it uh, a bit further and a bit faster. I'm very conscious of the fact that, uh, uh, as you'll be well aware, the Conservative government has got a majority of 80 in the House of Commons, and can therefore defeat anything that comes from the House of Lords, no matter how well supported it is and um, I never expected that the bill would in fact be successful in getting onto our statute book but I did think that it would provoke sufficient debate that the government might be forced to make some sort of concession uh, 
on the problems of the status of uh, of workers. And um, I should just tell you before I start on the content of the bill that when the bill was going through the House of Lom uh, House of Lords, uh, at all stages, it was supported by peers on all sides of the house, that's to say Tories, crossbenchers, bishops, former judges, and the assortment of people that we have in our Senate, our House of Lords. And the only person that spoke against it was the government minister. So uh, there's general acceptance that something needs to be done about this problem. Now, the identification of the problem course is something that uh, you here this afternoon are only too familiar with. The issue of course is a very simple one. It's that whatever the legal status of workers is, employers are always seeking, uh, as the, our Court of Appeal put it in one case, through armies of lawyers seeking ways to denigrate to demote that status and the reason that they do that is of course to avoid the consequences of, of uh, a higher status so employees of course enjoy full employment rights they might have to wait a period of time in order to qualify for particular rights but they uh, nominally are entitled to all employment rights uh, and lesser categories are entitled to lesser rights, the obvious one being self-employed workers who are not entitled to rights such as in our country, unfair uh, dismissal or even indeed certain health and safety uh, rights as well. That's the driving force. It's employers trying to avoid the consequential costs of having workers on higher status. Uh, and, and that, of course, is what this bill was designed to try and not avoid, but at least to diminish. And the way of doing it was to classify all workers as workers, as defined in the bill, uh, and uh, with the ex one exception, and that is genuinely self-employed. Uh, work workers. So I, I, as Paul says, I put a copy of the bill or the link to a copy of the bill in um, in the chat. So if you want to uh, look at that, we can deal with it very briefly. What w the new definition uh, in, in the various uh, statutes that regulate these things in the UK, the new definition is that a worker is someone who seeks to be engaged by another to provide labour or is engaged by another to provide labour or where the employment has ceased, was engaged by another to provide labour and is not in the provision of that labour, genuinely operating a business on his or her own account. And there's a sort of reciprocal definition of um, employer and a consequential definition where, where it's used in the various acts of employed and employment uh, and, and so on. So the only exemption then is, is uh, people that are genuinely engaged in a business on their uh, own account. But um, in uh, UK law, we've got uh, uh, a couple of additional problems, one of which is, is found in other jurisdictions, and it may be in South Africa, but uh, I'm not entirely sure, and one which I know is not. And that is that we, we have uh, a, a sort of intermediate category, which the lawyers call a limb, a limb B worker. And that it comes from the original definition of the employment relations Act of 1996 of Section 233B, and the 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 definition of of a work of an employee is limited in UK law, but there is this additional category of somebody who doesn't work under a contract of of uh, employment, but is but nevertheless is uh, engaged 
to perform uh, work uh, personally for another uh, party. That's the Lim B uh, worker. Now, Lim B workers don't have all the rights of employees, but they do have more rights, uh, statutory rights, this is, than uh, self-employed workers. So we've got three primary categories, employee, Limby worker, and the self-employed. Uh, but the, the other category which my bill deals with, which I do think is, is likely to be which is common in other jurisdictions, is the personal service company. And this, this is the uh, where John Hendy is employed by John Hendy Limited, and John Hendy Limited contracts John Hendy's services to some third party uh, em employer. Now for people who are uh, genuinely self-employed, a personal service company may well be a useful vehicle for them for tax or other reasons to market their services. The problem is, of course, the abuse of personal service co companies, which have proliferated in the United Kingdom in recent years. It's estimated currently that there are over 700,000 of, of them. Uh, and uh, al although the statistics don't reveal it, I believe that the vast majority are, are forced personal service companies. That's to say where John Hendy goes to seek work from uh, Paul Benjamin Limited and Paul Benjamin Limited says, yes, there is work for you, but uh, we're not gonna give you any unless you form a personal service company. And my accountants, in fact, will be happy to set one up for you. Indeed, I'll pay the costs of, of that. And John Hendy's really got no economic uh, choice if he wants the job, but to accept that offer and to supply services through a, a, a personal service company. So if you look further down my uh, bill, I've, included a specific definition of a personal service company which is intended to exclude the genuine users uh, by professionals of, of personal service companies but to protect those who are forced it, into it and the way of doing it is first of all if you look at subsection five on the second uh, page uh, the usual uh, in in five, 5A that the definition of, of the personal service company is one where either the worker or family members are the primary owners of the co company and B that they've contracted to provide labour to a third party nominated by the uh, company. Uh, but C is where the terms and conditions are substantially determined by the third party or jointly by the third party and someone else. And uh, finally, that the status of any third party is not in practice that of a client or customer of the professional business undertaking carried on by the worker. So by those means, I've, I've protected, uh, I hope I've pr protected uh, professionals, but I, I have included those who uh, really ought to be classed as employees or or uh, workers and entitled to um, to full uh, to full uh, rights. Now the bill um, uh, al also is intended to, because of the breadth of the division uh, of the definition of worker, it's in intended to uh, cover uh, bogus self-employment. That's which is which is of course very very common. I'm, I don't know how common it is in South Africa, but in Britain, particularly in certain trades and industry, for example, in construction. You won't get a job unless you agree that you're self-employed and you're going to be liable for your own tax and national insurance uh, and all, all the rest of it. So um, this bill includes all, all the bogus self-employed, but uh, leaves out those who are genuinely self-employed conducting a business on their own account. 
Um, I think the final thing to say about the bill is that it, uh, I can't remember where I put it now, but there's, there's a presumption uh, in favour of uh, em employment. Uh, yes, it's subsection two. It's for the person who's claimed to be the employer and contests that claim to show that they're not the employer uh, and the person is not an, um, uh, uh, a worker. So uh, w we hope that, uh, or I hope that that, uh, that if, if this had come to pass, that that, uh, that would assist uh, workers in claiming the, all the benefits of, of being a worker. Now, um, because of the political situation in which this bill was introduced, uh, I am very conscious, although I didn't admit it in the House of Lords, I am very conscious that it's, it's not a perfected piece of le legislation. There are anomalous cases which I haven't dealt with dealt with and I, I'm sure that the um, participants this afternoon can think of several but I, I can think of, of one or two such as uh, company directors who, who may be self-employed or may be employees or who may be neither uh, and foster carers who sometimes are employees and sometimes are, are not. Now I think that, that, that these anomalous cases uh, would merit, if this ever became legislation, additional treatment. But as I say, I, I was concerned with the political realities of trying to get this through Parliament, or at least being influential in persuading the government that it really ought to do something about what is a major, major uh, uh, problem. And I say it's a major problem for this reason, that there are 32 million people in Britain who uh, earn a living through work, but only 28 million of, of them are employees, according to the Office for National Statistics, which means that there are 5 million people uh, who are not. Now, of those, of course, there will be some, perhaps a million or two, who are genuinely self-employed, like barristers or... Uh, house painters or uh, taxi drivers or authors or self-employed journalists or gigging musicians or people of that kind. But I think the vast majority of that five million are people who are in, let, let's uh, describe it as an abusive relationship with, a, with an entity which pretends not to be uh, it's the the employer of the people uh, concerned. So it's a widespread problem. And of course, it's got ramifications well beyond the employment, the consequential employment rights of the people uh, concerned, because it has, uh, it has um, uh, implications for tax and national insurance. I, I did say when I introduced this bill that the bill wasn't purporting to alter tax and national insurance relations. Uh, and that is so, you can see on the face of the bill that it doesn't deal with tax and national insurance at all. But of course, the again, the political reality would be that if you do change the nature of the legal relationship between the worker and the employer, there will be implications for tax and national insurance. And certainly the tax authorities are going to say, right, well, if you're uh, a worker, then we want you taxed as a worker and we want to tax the employer as the employer uh, also, which of course has got consequences for the revenue going into the government uh, I I exchequer. Um, there's one other, since we're talking about economic consequences, there's one other consequence which I uh, engage to try and persuade uh, the Tories in the House of Lords, some of whom were actually supportive of the proposition, um, that they should support it. And, and that economic argument is, is a relatively simple one, that this is one measure which would tend towards preventing undercutting. So if all employers in a particular trade or industry are faced with the fact that they have to 
treat their workforce as employees, then they can't undercut in the same way on, uh, on labour costs. Of course, it doesn't solve the problem of what the wage rates are, and that's a matter to be dealt with by collective bargaining, which is something I want to talk about uh, in just uh, a minute. So uh, that's, that's one uh, economic uh, uh, application of this um, uh, of this uh, bill, uh, should it ever uh, come about. But let me uh, mention a couple of things that it doesn't deal with and doesn't purport to deal with, and that is other forms of atypical, uh, well, so I say it's atypical work, but it's becoming more and more typical, isn't it? These, these uh, non-standard uh, arrangements for, uh, for working, for example, uh, zero hours contracts, that's to say where the worker uh, has a contract with the employer, but the employer doesn't have any obligation to provide any hours of work uh, at all. The provision is merely that if hours of work are provided, then they'll be paid at such and such a rate and various consequences follow entitlement, holiday pay, rest breaks and all, all the rest of it. Now these zero hours contracts are, are, are of course um, becoming more and more common and are a major contribution to the precariousness of, uh, of uh, a big section of the workforce today. Of the 28 million employees, we don't know how many people are on zero hours contracts, but it's certainly a, a growing number. And these are people who can't predict uh, the hours that they're going to work from one week to another, or of course, what their income is likely to be from one week to another. It's, it's a condition of, uh, uh, of servitude. Uh, so um, another uh, category that, it that the bill doesn't deal with is um, agency workers which is really a, a, a slightly more sophisticated form of the personal service company, but the worker has got no share or interest, financial interest in the agency. It's simply that the worker is engaged by the agency and the agency supplies the services of the worker to the uh, end user. Um, there are some statutory restrictions on that in Britain, but they are very, very limited. And there's room there for a, a more legislation to protect um, agency workers. And the bill also doesn't deal with a problem which um, has been rampant since uh, COVID in Britain, and that is fire and rehire. Now this concerns uh, employed uh, workforces where the employer uh, says to the workforce, right, I'm gonna terminate all your contracts of employment now. I'm gonna give you uh, the appropriate notice to do so under the contract. You can't complain about that, but I'm gonna, and I'm gonna offer to rehire you, but on lesser uh, wages, terms and, and conditions. Now, so far as uh, UK law is concerned, there's no restraint on that whatsoever. So long as the contract's brought to an end lawfully, either by providing the appropriate notice or paying pay in lieu, lieu of notice, there's nothing that the work, workforce can do about that. And then um, on St. Patrick's Day, uh, uh, six weeks ago, uh, we had the ultimate expression of fire and rehire, on p o ferries these are uh, a major uh, company which uh, operates ferries from britain to ireland and britain to france and to mainland uh, europe which decided to sack uh, all its workforce based in britain 786 work workers and replace them with workers that it recruited 
in underdeveloped countries from South America, India, and so on, on a fraction of the uh, of the wages. It did break the law. It admitted breaking the law, but it made such substantial payments to the sacked workers that it wasn't worth their while bringing tribunal claims. Uh, and therefore, uh, the the, uh, the company appeared to have got away with it. Everybody was completely outraged, including the government, but the proposals that they put forward uh, really don't resolve the problems. But that's by the by. This this bill doesn't assist on, on that matter um, either. Now, I said I, I wanted to say just a word about collective bar bargaining, um, and I would like to do that because there's a case in which I'm involved at the moment, which has been ongoing for the last four years, um, uh, which is the Independent Workers of Great Britain, which is a, a, a quite a new uh, union uh, against Deliveroo, uh, Roo Foods Limited. And these are uh, riders, cyclists, predominantly cyc cyclists, who deliver food from restaurants. They are engaged by uh, Deliveroo, uh, and Deliveroo takes orders from the restaurant, restaurant phones up, says, I got a, an order for uh, John Hendy living at number 75, so-and-so, so-and-so, send a, a, a rider around to deliver it. The rider is then sent by app to the restaurant, picks up the food and takes it to the delivery uh, address. Now, in that case, we were seeking collective bargaining rights. And in the UK, there is a limited provision for, uh, to, for a union to obtain uh, recognition for the purposes of collective bargaining. But that right it's all sorts of ways in which it's circumscribed, but the operative way in this case was that uh, in order to be eligible, the workers have to be employees or at least uh, limby workers. And on, under either a statutory definition, one of the qualities is that they must be, uh, they must give personal service and the courts have interpreted that in the past as as meaning that they can't subcontract out the work that they've uh, they've um that they've under undertaken and in deliveroo's case the armies of lawyers that deliveroo uh, engaged had drafted a contract which provided that the rider was entitled to uh, subcontract uh, a delivery if that's what they wanted to uh, do. Of course the vast majority of riders never avail themselves of that provision uh, and it was only very very few who had ever uh, known of anybody who had used the the provision. Uh, not surprisingly because they were only getting three pounds fifty a delivery which is um, uh, not very much at all. So there's no no room, hardly any room to make uh, a profit if you subcontracted the work, um, uh, if you subcontracted the work out. But <clears throat> we we lost that case um, uh, ultimately in the co court of appeal. The court of appeal holding that that the these workers were not um, uh, under a contract for personal service. Now, I tried to argue the European Convention on Human Rights, which in Article 11 provides the right of freedom of association and the right to belong to a trade union for the protection of one's interests. And I know there are similar provisions in the Constitution of South Africa as well. But the court were not persuaded that that was sufficient and they had regard to uh, decisions of the European Court of uh, Human Rights, which they deduced, uh, didn't displace a restriction on excluding from the right to collective bargaining workers who uh, subcontracted, uh, who were, had the right to subcontract their work. Now, I must say, I think the logic of that is completely indefensible. I'm waiting now to hear uh, 
whether we've got permission to take that case to the Supreme Court. But had my bill been law, of course, that would have been completely obviated because as you see from the def definition of worker there, there's no exclusion for personal service. It's simply the provision of, of labor on, on uh, any basis. Um, finally, I'd like to say about collective bargaining this, again, it's a European um, issue. And that is uh, under EU law, um, the law of competition, of course, prevents uh, uh, suppliers combining together to set uh, the rates on which they'll supply their uh, services. It's Article 101 of the EU uh, Treaty. That uh, provision was used in Ireland against a unions of self-employed workers who had negotiated successfully collective agreements to set the rates on which they were would work. In the first case, it, it was a uh, equity, which is now part of SIP2, uh, the actors union, and uh, they they had negotiated uh, minimum terms and conditions for voiceover actors. You know, the people that do the voiceovers for radio and television and film adverts. Uh, and the comp Irish Competition Authority said that this was imp imp impermissible uh, and we said because I, I conducted this case on behalf of the Irish Confederation of Trade Unions uh, we said no all workers have got the right to bargain collectively and that includes workers who are self-employed as well as those who are employed and we took the case to uh, the sister body of the European Court of Human Rights called the European Committee on Social uh, Rights and drew to their attention all the uh, ILO jurisprudence that I know you guys are familiar with, which says that self-employed, uh, as well as every other category of worker, is entitled to the right to bargain uh, collectively. And we won on that point in the uh, European uh, Committee on, on Social Rights. Uh, rights, they said, yes, it, it, all workers have got the right to bargain collectively, including the self-employed. And as a consequence of, of that, the European Commission is now drafting a, a, a directive which will in some way exclude self-employed workers from attack under competition law uh, against a setting terms and conditions collectively through collective bargaining. So I think that that's an important uh, measure and it should be more widely known, but I don't know what the threat of competition law is like outside, uh, outside Europe. Of course, it was an issue that arose in the 19th century in Britain uh, and was dealt with statutorily where in uh, 1875 when legislation provided that trade unions were not to be unlawful for being in restraint of trade which is, is exactly the same exactly the same point paul i'm sorry i've digressed somewhat from the um, bill but uh, i see that i've used up more than the time that i had hoped i would spend so thank you all for listening Thanks very much, John, both for, for setting out the bill and, um, you know, pointing to its, its potential and, and its limitations and, and, and for contextualizing it. And as you indicated, you know, many of the issues do crop up in, in South Africa, um, but obviously in, in sort of um, different, different ranking and, and different, um, you know, at, at different levels, so as, as everyone knows. We, for instance, do have some regulation around agencies, temporary employment services, but um, so the issues, for instance, of, of um, organization by, in, in our case, particularly Uber drivers um, and, and Uber food, uh, sort of food couriers is, is a key thing. And I just wanted to indicate before I hand over to Darcy, I don't, many of you may not be aware of the, there's been a lot of recent work, particularly by, um, Professor Eddie Webster and his colleagues in Joburg uh, 
on, on, on the, the food delivery drivers. Um, and many of whom, you know, as you know, have, have organized strikes. And um, one of the issues that will require addressing is, is, is not only the way in which, which those large international companies seek out vulnerable workers, but for instance, we find with, with, with you know, ride hail drivers in, in Johannesburg, two, two stunning features. One is that 95% are foreigners and that triggers a, a range of debates that go beyond labor law. And secondly, that they have one of the highest rates of accidents among any profession in the world. Right? It's more dangerous to be, you know, to be a, a, a motorbike driver driving through a Johannesburg thunderstorm getting uh, you know, Chinese food to a house in the northern suburbs than it is to, to work underground in a mine. So there, there's a lot of food for thought there. So I wanted initially my colleague um, from UWC, Darcy DeToy, just to make some initial comments um, to, to, to locate um, John's thoughts um, within the South African context. And then I had asked Chris Todd um, and Debbie um, Collier both to, to make further comments. I'm not sure if, if both of them are available, but, but initially then over, over to Darcy DeToy. Um, Darcy, as you all know, is, is a professor at UWC for many years. He's now also based in, in UK, but continuing to engage in, in our domestic debates. Darcy, uh, if you can take some time to just contextualize John's presentation. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, John. That was a most um, stimulating, thought-provoking contribution. I won't try to respond to all the points. Many of them do touch closely on our own situation in South Africa, others um, less so, but I'll, um, I'll limit myself to a, a few aspects. And the personal service companies, for example, and that is something which, in, in my opinion, does not play the same kind of role. Um, we did have what they call close corporations being formed by employees to market their own services, but not used in the same way, I think, here it's more the, the question of employers insisting that people who work for them are independent contractors, self-employed, and therefore disguised employment becomes the problem and with all the case law that goes with that. <clears throat> Agency workers likewise, as Paul said, it was an extremely um, sensitive thing here. Unions correctly saw it as a major um, undermining of labor rights and that has been to some extent now <clears throat> regulated. It's worth noting of course that um, agency workers um, are a, a creature of statute because on the ordinary common law test they would have been employees of the client or the user. It took a special provision of, of section 198 of the LRA to turn them into employees of the labor broker or the agency quite artificially. So I mean, one way would be to, to simply revoke that. But um, having a um, comprehensive definition um, of worker slash employee um, would of course deal with that in, 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 at a stroke. And I think the main point that you dealt with, the, the purpose of the bill is hugely important, probably in most, if not all jurisdictions, so much hinges on that. Few court cases, or not few, but very many court cases, shall we say, start off with jurisdictional points being taken and very often the status of the worker is something that can be very contentious and quite difficult for judges often to um, deal with um, adequately given the way that employers learn from past history and the Ubers of this world, for example, rewriting their contracts in the light of the latest litigation and so on. So it really does need something, I think, fairly root and branch, such as a new definition to cut across that and um, probably save millions of hours in court time and billions of pounds, dollars or whatever of lawyers' fees um, and get to the merits of, of disputes. Um, Bogus self-employment um, is, of course, um, I think in, in most countries, uh, a, a, a serious um, issue. 
um, at the at the high end of the economy, such as the platform economy, as well as less skilled and professions. Um, although I suppose one difference between South Africa and Europe is that here yeah, very often employers don't bother so much about the legalities. They simply go in for what they call um, um, informal work, um, which you know, there's a, quite a literature on that, um, many meanings given to it. But I think from a legal point of view, the key feature of so-called informal work is simply that it is, it is not complying with the law. It simply means that um, the employer disregards the applicable law um, or certain applicable laws, others possibly that they, they might comply with. And the worker is normally not in a position to argue, even if they knew the law, if they want the job, they take it on the terms on which it's given, take it or leave it. And so um, you know, this whole thing about the informal economy um, being seen as a sphere of study and a discipline in itself, legally, I think it's important to recognize its essential feature is simply non-compliance with the law. And that really takes me in, into one point that I'd like to make in response to John. And I think when we spoke, I did also mention this in passing, but we didn't really um, explore it. And that is um, the fact that a, a, a comprehensive and I would say proper definition of worker as identifying the class of persons who are entitled to the protection of labor law. That is, of course, the, the foundation of all employment and labor law. But the second question to which that gives rise is what rights are then triggered? Now, um, one case in point in South Africa, which um, our unit at UWC has been closely involved with over the years, including participating in Convention 189 of the ILO, the Domestic Work Convention back in 2011. Um, I think domestic workers really epitomize the point that they are in terms of UK law, as, as John explained it to us, um, um, in most ways, in every way, at the highest level of protection. They are classified as employees for all practical purposes. Their partial exclusion from the Compensation for um, Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act has finally been um, uplifted and they are now being um, given that protection as well. They are at the highest level really of legal protection but, and, and, and have been so for very since the late 1990s when the post constitutional labor reforms took effect. Yet in practice, their conditions have not changed fundamentally. They undoubtedly have been improved and certainly um, they are entitled to a, to a legal minimum wage. They're entitled to protection against unfair dismissal and unfair discrimination. They're entitled to bargain collectively and to, to, to go on strike. That they have all those rights, but for obvious reasons, they can't utilize those rights very effectively. And even the rights which could potentially be you know, of direct um, application to them, for example, maximum hours, minimum wages, paid leave, really are widely disregarded um, because there's um, very few means of enforcement. The Department of Labor, as in most countries, operates an inspectorate. But inspectorates, I think in no country in the world, is able to police every workplace, um, especially in, in domestic workplaces with a million approximately domestic workers, a million workplaces, and a few thousand inspectors. Um, it will never be enforced in that way, and the workers themselves are not in a position really to take action against their employer without running a very um, real, perceived or real risk of dismissal. It's interesting that um, domestic workers do refer unfair dismissal disputes to, to the CCMA um, in, in, in proportions equivalent to their uh, share in the labor force. But um, 
only unfair dismissal disputes. I'm not aware myself, possibly some of my colleagues from the CCMA can correct me on this, but I'm not aware of any cases where domestic workers have referred cases of any kind against their current employer. Um, they, and, and I think academic studies also have shown that domestic workers tend to prefer to negotiate some kind of um, quote informal unquote arrangement with employers that, that, that lead to some kind of bearable conditions um, for them. That is not to say that these rights are entirely disregarded, but I would argue that it's really the employers who, who choose to comply, do comply. Um, the state has very few means of compelling compliance and um, workers themselves have also very few um, ways of doing so. so. So I think it's a question here of that distinction of South African law between substantive and formal equality uh, it comes in here as well. Formally, domestic workers have got all those rights. In substance, they don't. So to my mind, the, the big challenge that once we leap that threshold of the employee is the be all and end all of labor law into the broader work of workers in general, including non-standard work in all its infinite permutations, then I think we also need to, to start taking up the question of what forms of protection are then appropriate. For example, um, 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 the, the right to bargain collectively it, it, it is entirely appropriate, I would say, in the in the standard workplace, especially in medium to large workplaces. It was designed for that historically, and it still works in that environment. It doesn't need to be reinvented. But in other kinds of workplaces, the conditions for co collective bargaining don't really exist. And John referred to deliver ruin. I think this is a very good example, and that is actually, well, in, in every country there might be different challenges and. Uh, and I, we note the one that, that applies in the case of the UK, and I do hope that leave to appeal is given. That will be a very interesting um, case, case to follow. Um, but I think in a number of countries, I think on the continent, in Italy and elsewhere, um, the delivery drivers have been relatively successful in forming organisations and beginning to bargain collectively. I think in Denmark and elsewhere, there have been collective bargains agreements covering such workers. Um, I would say though that what distinguishes those workers is that they are um, most, um, if you like, employee-like, they resemble the standard employee most closely. They do work in large numbers for companies like Deliveroo. They do physically have the opportunity to meet when they park their vehicles outside restaurants and so on. It's almost, it's, it's not quite the same, they face huge obstacles too, but there is some resemblance to the, to call it the, the factory conditions where trade unions have norm, after, um, historically been able to organize most effectively. And so where new forms of work take on that physical shape where the workers are able to be together in the same place at the same time, um, communicating, then I think there's more of a basis for traditional collective bargaining. Um, but what about the, um, the, um, the uh, workers who work, the, the cloud workers who might be in different countries and never see each other, or for that matter, domestic workers who work one per household, and even if and when, and to some extent, in South Africa, they have, have managed to form unions, but not large unions, not stable unions, and they've certainly not done the things that unions normally do. Certainly, they don't have to bargain collectively, because who do you bargain with? You can't, the, the law can't really, in South Africa at least, compel employers to organize to bargain collectively, because there is no duty to bargain and also there's freedom of association. And so um, it really means to my mind, and I won't try to pursue this because of time, but it, what it says to me is that if that constitutional right to engage in collective bargaining um, is to be given effect in practice in, in the real world, it would need to be translated into something other than the model of trade unions, which essentially mean industrial trade unions, and 
large-scale employers or employers' organizations, because neither of those do you have in a sector like that, nor in the platform economy, with the exception partially of um, delivery drivers and so on. But um, in, in many other forms of non-standard work, you simply don't have those conditions. But those workers are entitled, without exception, to the same rights as formal employees. And so we lawyers and academics and scholars need to, I think, engage with that question of what form do you give these rights so that they can be meaningful to those new forms of new types of workers who will be rightly covered by the definition, extended definition of um, employee or worker. And this applies across the board for all those other rights of employees or workers which workers may or may not have but can't be enforced even if they do have them and so i would say absolutely yes that um you know um we, we do want to see um the status of workers bill become law in the uk we'd like to see similar laws in countries elsewhere including south africa um but then i think it raises in the further question what work do we then do to make sure that those new cohorts of workers who are now formally entitled to legal protection, that they also enjoy those rights in practice? And um, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, um, Darcy, for that very thorough um, uh, location of the presentation in, in our context. Um, I had uh, Debbie Collier. Are you able to to make some thoughts? Debbie, in particular, was involved in the um, drafting of the, the the National Minimum Wage Act, which in many ways throws up some of the um, key issues that we need to debate. And that is that the the definition of of or well, the scope of the National Minimum Wage Act is is defined as a as a broader concept of worker. And that really has triggered the issue of to what extent should that broader definition be extended to other rights? For instance, you have a group of workers, for instance, who are now entitled to the national minimum wage, but are not entitled to, to collective bargaining, which does throw up both anomalies and, and perhaps constitutional issues. So Debbie, are, are you here to, to talk to that? I'm here, thanks Paul. Though so I, I won't speak to the definition in the national minimum wage, I think that might have been your drafting, um, and, but it would be interesting to hear from our CCMA commissioners whether that has thrown up problems in practice, but it certainly was our intention to, to make it easier for, for a worker to claim uh, the right to, to, to a minimum wage. I wanted to speak specifically, thank you, Paul, for giving me this opportunity, but to um, John, I must disclose that I sit, um, I sit with your manifesto and rolling out the manifesto for labor law on my desk. I've been involved in, <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, I've been involved in some law reform projects in the region and just looking at how, you know, your group, um, in fact, I even subscribed to the Institute for Employment Rights so that I could access some of your hidden documents. Um, and, um, you know, you, you sketch out a plan for a new collective bargaining act and for this single status, and it's quite clear the direction that you're heading in. But then you present a status, you know, a worker status bill, and you admit it's modest. It doesn't include all forms of atypical work. And then, you know, you're unlikely to get it through the House of Commons. So what does that mean for the long term? And what does it mean? I'm assuming that that was kind of a hoping that a collective bargaining act would follow. Um, so I guess it leaves a kind of depressing sense of is, is political change likely that would make, what's your next move or what's the strategy to push, um, yeah, you know, both forms, both the, both the, individual kind of status of a worker and also the collective bargaining revitalizing the framework i'd be really keen to hear if we have time for that paul otherwise i'm rather leaving that as a comment i'm not sure how we're doing for time and there may be others who want to speak but thank you it was really 
um, good to to hear you. And yeah, I've engaged with your manifesto quite extensively over the last few months. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, um, Debbie. And um, I, I think John's work in the Institute of Employment Rights has been very important over the years and as, is a, a rich source of comparative material for our debates. I had asked Chris Todd, I hadn't seen any note from him, but Chris, are you part of the meeting and, and happy to speak at this stage? Chris is one of our distinguished um, labor law attorneys. Um, I'm not hearing any response, so perhaps he's had to leave. Um, are there other people who, who wish to, to, to contribute to the debate? I had put in a note, um, but we haven't had any, um, any responses, but I'm sure there must be a range of, of comments that, that people might wish to, to make both as to the, you know, the relevance of this type of proposal to, to the state of South African labor law or um, to get more of a sense of, of how some of the comparative issues have been dealt with in the, in the UK. Are there any people wanting to speak? Uh, Paul, uh, it's um, um, one of the participants. I uh, got the invite sure, from sure. Uh, from Tony Novitz uh, because I'm doing a, a postgraduate course there. But I'm an HR practitioner in uh, in uh, for you know that's my job for a, a living. That's how I earn my living. And uh, my question uh, just hangs on to Debbie, and I don't think there will be uh, probably time uh, for John to answer this, but. Um, you know, seeing the draft legislation, but also seeing that on, for example, whistleblowing that it's from the House of Lords direction that uh, initiatives are being pushed towards the House of Governments in the UK. Uh, I would be interested, uh, John, at one point to hear your views and response to Debbie's question on, you know, the strategy of how to drive meaningful change in labour law legislation in the UK because uh, there are uh, myriads of papers uh, uh, commenting on the various uh, issues that crop up. And to me, it seems that there is an ab obvious gap for a comprehensive uh, uh, you know, labor market reform and uh, a comprehensive legislative program. But as you pointed out, with the majority of the conservatives in the House of Commons, it's, uh, it's an uphill struggle to put it mildly. And, so I would be interested to read at one point, at least, you know, in more detail, your view on how can a meaningful change come about and, uh, and, and, you know, what your views are on that, because that would be fascinating to hear. Uh, <clears throat> Paul, with your permission, if I could also just ask a question. Uh, Etienne, sure, go, go ahead. Uh, well, I <clears throat> I worry if you confuse me with Etienne. It's uh, oh, sorry, it, it, your name came up as uh, Etienne. This is um, Andre Andre Creel, who's the, the general secretary of the South African Clothing and Textile Workers. Welcome, Andre. Hey. Nice to have you. Uh, with <clears throat> thank us. you, uh, Paul. Uh, I am more interested in what the um, organised labour response has been all of this. So I don't know whether they have, um, for example, submitted, uh, you know, supporting uh, uh, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> supporting documents or whether they've dealt with the issue organizationally. So maybe they can hear some comments uh, about labor response to this. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thanks for that, Shane Godfrey, if you'd like to Uh, thanks very much, Paul, and, and thank you, John, for a, a very interesting um, presentation. I, I just the, there have been comparisons made in terms of the labour law in South Africa and the UK, but I suppose I'm interested more in the uh, 
the differences in the economies and the labor markets in the two countries. And I, I, this is probably going to be interpreted the wrong way, um, but you know, just one stat I've just looked up now, UK April 2022 unemployment rate of 3.8%, South Africa fourth quarter 2021 unemployment rate of 35.3%. And that's lo long-term unemployment. That's deep structural unemployment. Um, I'd, I'd just be interested in your comment on that and the comment of others as well, because I would think one needs in South Africa a much more radical approach to a, an, a new labor law regime in the country um, that is going to ensure workers' rights um, but at the same time is going to be meshed with industrial policy and with macroeconomic reform um, in, in a way that's going to start dealing with that unemployment rate. But I, I would really uh, appreciate your comment. Thanks very much. I think, uh, John, if you could perhaps, there have been a, a range of questions posed to you. Um, about the sort of the broader reform agenda, the, uh, the labor, organized labor's response and the, I suppose the contextual issues raised by the, the differences between the UK and uh, the SA um, uh, economy. Uh, if perhaps if you'd you know, have some thoughts on that, on that broader context, we'd be interested to hear it at this stage. Yeah. C certainly, Paul. Well, uh, thank you for the, those uh, those questions. I deal with uh, Andrea's question first, which was the trade union response to the uh, really the transformational program that was put forward by the Institute of Employment Rights, which included, as Debbie said, re reforms to sectoral collective bargaining or the the advancement of sectoral collective bargaining, as well as uh, status of workers and all sorts of other changes to unfair dismissal, redundancy, equality law, control of the supply uh, labor conditions within the supply chains and so on. Uh, the, the trade union respo response was overwhelmingly uh, supportive. Uh, uh, and the only disagreements we had were uh, trivial matters of, of uh, uh, technicalities about you know how, how you best uh, ensure that uh, work rotors are a, provided well in advance so that people knew how many hours and when they would be and that sort of thing so yeah uh, overwhelming support but which which leads me to the next point which is that uh, of course the labor parties had a change of leadership and a change of uh, policy but under the current leader uh, the, a working group was set up of trade union representatives presided over by the then shadow Minister for em Employment and Prote uh, 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 Employment Rights and Protections, Andy McDonald, to which I was the advisor. And we came up with, with um, uh, a document called a New Deal for, uh, what's it called? Uh, an a new a new deal for working paper uh, and and this has been was adopted at the labor party conference last year uh, in september and ha, 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 was spoken to at conference by the deputy leader of the labor party angela rayner and we had a a um a meeting at the Labour Party conference afterwards, which was also addressed by Keir Starmer, the current leader of the Labour Party. So at the moment, that new deal for working people, which is basically a, a sort of summary of the key points of the Institute of Employment Rights uh, transformational plan, uh, is the policy of the Labour Party. Now, I think it, it uh, we all recognise that it, the role of the trade unions will be to make sure that there's no slippage in that uh, commitment. So the political plan for the future in answer to Debbie and Peter's question is that it's essential that we get a Labour uh, government elected uh, 
which can push through that radical employment uh, uh, agenda and has got the determination uh, to do so because there will be uh, if a Labour government should get in it, it will have an enormous uh, range of things to deal with in particular the whole raft of autocratic neo-fascist legislation that has been pushed pushed through parliament by the tories in the last uh, year or so has all got to be reversed so we've got to make sure that that radical agenda is is pushed through now the likelihood is that at the next election which is 20 will be probably uh 2024 late 2024 um neither party will get an overwhelming majority i mean anything is possible in politics but that's the current thinking so that it'll be a slim majority on either side now with a slim majority neither party is likely to put through a really radical agenda on the other hand bits of the program might well be a, a suitable to be pushed through no matter which party is in the majority uh, and one of those would be the status of of uh, work workers bills bill i i would think that so th there's a real possibility of doing bits and pieces i should tell you that the conservative party when it was elected in 2019 announced that it would introduce an employment bill to strengthen work workers rights uh, and it would do it in the, the the session of parliament that followed it hasn't done so and we're told we won't find out until the queen's speech on the 10th of may we're told that the prime minister himself torpedoed a proposal from the relevant state department that there should be an employment bill included in the next parliamentary session so we're not thinking that there will be an employment bill so as debbie says it's a very in the short term it is a very depressing uh outlook in in britain now um shane are, says well to what extent is the industrial situation comparable in in britain and the and south africa given for example the d wide discrepancy in employment or unemployment uh, rates i think the answer to that is that there is a that why discrepancy is, is obvious and the range of economic activity in both countries is uh, very different however the need for transformational change in britain simply because it's got a low unemployment rate is not diminished at, at all I, I, it's not for me to say what the need for transformational labor law changes in in south africa but but the uh, small unemployment rate masks uh, two outstanding realities the first is that millions of those workers are only working part-time to qualify not to be unemployed for the purposes of the office of national statistic it it's only necessary to be employed for one hour a week now one hour a week at the minimum wage of nine pounds fifty is not enough for a person to live for a day let alone a, a week so so that um lack of employment is a major problem in britain now, I wouldn't say it was as great as the lack of employment in South Africa, but it's still a huge problem. And the problem which goes with it is low wages. Once again, low wages in Britain is still significantly higher than low wages in South Africa. But so is the cost of living in Britain as well. We've got a four and a half million people living below the poverty line the latest changes brought about by the last uh, budget announced by the chancellor of the exchequer a, a month ago is estimated to put a, another 400,000 children into poverty millions of people now faced with the inflation in britain over energy and so on uh, are going to have to be choosing between eating and heating their homes so 
there are don't don't be misled by a low unemployment figure it masks a, a, an awful situation wages r the real value of wages is falling and it hasn't risen for the last 13 years that's the situation where i i personally think we're going back to the levels of the depression in the 1930s and whether people are going to stand for it this winter uh is is i think a, a moot point Thanks, John. Um, thanks for, for dealing with those contextual questions. And um, there is a, a detailed question that's been put on um, on, on the chat um, by Madeleine Lawson from the um, CCMA, pointing out uh, to with pride that we, have, we do have some provisions, particularly dealing with the protection of agency workers. But she does ask a question. It's always one of interest, and perhaps you could discuss this, is, is whether in the UK, contracts of employment have to be in writing. Um, is there a form of the contract um, and what she calls thresholds? And perhaps in that discussion, if you could, um, it's one of the issues perhaps outside your, your bill, but one that we obviously often are um, right, uh, right in our debate, and that is the, the question particularly of qualifying periods for protection of rights, which I, I, I'm not sure what the the current length is, but it, it, it's certainly an issue on in our debate. And perhaps you could just uh, you know give us a sense of, of what the issues there are. Yes, uh, uh, certainly. I I see that that the question also uh, points to higher and fire and re rehire protections in the Labour Relations Act. I'm going to consult Darcy's textbook when we finish today, just to see what those are. That could be very useful to us because we did draft a, a private member's bill for a, an MP in the Commons on fire and rehire, which the government shot down. I'll see if there's anything we can learn from your experience there. On contracts of employment, no. Contracts of employment can be verbal or in writing or indeed by Im implication, but there is an obligation that, that employees are given uh, um, uh, as there is a statutory obligation that workers are given within 13 weeks of starting particulars of their contract of, of employment in writing and there's also obligations to provide a r itemized wage statements and and uh, so so forth now like as uh, Darcy pointed out earlier like many other o obligations these are often except in big well-organized co companies these are often these form part of those obligations which are often uh, ignored indeed my my own daughter was working uh, as a waitress in a, a, a restaurant waiting to go to college and uh, uh, in spite of um, advice from her father she was given no written particulars nor an itemized pay statement for any of the wages that she uh, received so um, and then you ask about um, qualifying periods the answer is that for all these statutory rights there are qualifying uh, periods some are um, as it were zero uh, but um, many of them are much longer than that so for example Un the right to unfair dismissal pure and simple you've got to be employed for two years before you qualify uh, for that right whereas if you're unfairly dismissed of trade union activity that right you're eligible to protection for that right uh, from day one of your employment so it varies from right to right what the qualifying period is and and some of them are on a sliding scale as one would expect for entitlement to holiday pay for example depends how many weeks you've worked as to how many weeks of paid holiday you're entitled uh to so it's it's very it's very va variable but it's um easy to um uh google the answer if you've got any particular right in question all right um the, the next speaker is, is is winnie everett who's a senior commissioner from the ccma and in fact the 
the author of a very significant award in which she found that um, Uber drivers were in fact employees. Unfortunately, it was um, overturned on a technical ground that Uber wasn't an employer because it lived in Amsterdam. Um, but uh, anyway, Winnie, over to you, and perhaps you can give us a sense of how you feel about those issues as well. Uh, thanks, Paul. What I wanted to uh, pick up on is, uh, I guess it touches on um, the issues that Shane raised around essentially, I guess, having introducing a piece of legislation such as this in South Africa, um, but at the same time balancing perhaps that degree of regulation with our high unemployment. Um, I'd certainly, I'd certainly be in favor of such, such legislation. Um, and I think what, what motivates that answer is that where we're seeing some of the greatest abuses um, are not in the areas of where, where employers perhaps cannot afford um, the, a, a more regulated arrangement. Um, what, what much like Uber, we, which, which is still now not recognized as an employer, um, we have the, the, the rise of the checkers delivery guys on their motorcycles, um, who there was actually apparently a case at the CCMA um, of an alleged unfair dismissal. It got given to a relatively new commissioner um, who decided in favor of checkers that because they had a contract that said it needed to go to private arbitration, that um, that that private arbitration agreement had to be held up. And then of course it had the other point that they weren't employees, that they're independent contractors. So by allowing that to go to private arbitration, the CCMA lost the chance, so to speak, to find that they are actually employees. And we haven't seen, to my knowledge, further cases. Same with Uber, there, was, there would have been an opportunity to, despite um, the labor court approach on that technical ground, they would, you know, we could have seen fresh referrals and, and more um, challenges, but they just didn't come in. And same, yeah, we're not seeing, we're seeing exactly the same trend with the, with the checkers. So, uh, yeah, my point is that if, you know, we should be regulating this more and, um, and our challenge is to, it's, it's not as though it would really impact unemployment because there's no question that there would um, there's a need for these guys to deliver especially now you know this massive increase in these delivery uh, deliveries and this type of service since COVID um, but I, I think that certainly the the big players like Checkers and Uber can afford a greater degree of regulation. Um, just on Debbie's question around whether we'd seen any increase on um, people referring around the minimum wage, the number that you can just, the kind of worker idea as opposed to having to be an employee. Again, we're not really seeing um, people claiming minimum wages if they're not traditional employees or categorized or recognized as employees. So even though that act makes provision for it, for a worker working four hours or more, whatever, the, I can't remember the exact cutoff, um, we're not actually seeing those cases coming in. Thanks. Thanks. Any any further hands? Um, John, there's one. Uh, besides responding to that, I see there's there's one. Oh, Laurie Warwick, you would you like to 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 join the debate then? Can you unmute yourself or can we unmute you? Um, is this within my Sorry, power? That's a, no, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. I had to rethink really of that one. Thanks very much. And, and so, John, yeah, thanks very much. It's really, it's very um, useful what you're doing here. The one comment I have is, um, you know, just from working at the CCMA for many years, is when sometimes legislation is too complicated and and you, what you almost need to do is start at the end for the person sitting in the hearing room and is trying to work backwards to say, well, how do I, how do I apply this law um, to different scenarios? And I was looking at the various definitions and I can, I can immediately see if this was ours, 
it it would be I don't know it's not it's not a criticism but it's it's the simple the better if you when you when you're drafting definitions and and um, you know uh, uh, legislation like this um, one of the things we're trying to do is to take our existing legislation for example and write it in a simplified way for small employers um, so that's that's a project we're busy with and so that would be my only thing is is, is maybe get an employee or, or a worker to try and um, how can I say fit themselves into the definitions you've got or the person who's got to apply it because I, I that's where I just find that sometimes it, it it doesn't always get used and maybe also with the our own legislation the national minimum wage there's that complexity because if there's a definition of worker for example, then suddenly there's an unfair labor practice provision, but the LRA doesn't have a provision for workers. So it's all these things that you, you need to just keep things as simple as possible. That, that would be my only um, suggestion. Thank you. Thanks, um, Laurie. Um, well, we do have representatives of NEDLAC present, so um, if they would remember that um, advice that, that future drafting should be as simple as possible. I see we do have some um, can distinguished Canadian uh, arbitrators and lawyers present. I wondered if any of one of them wanted to to make a little input as to, to how things are, are going in this regard in the, the Canadian front, because Canada often also does offer some very interesting examples of, of regulatory responses to um, to developments in this area. So if, if either of the, or the, any of the Canadian respond, uh, participants would like to do that, the, the floor would be yours. Um, all right. Um, well, uh, in, in the absence of, of um, John, would you like to, to respond to, to some of those issues and then we can um, perhaps allow a further round and if, if, no, if there are any further questions and then we'll, we'll close proceedings. So John, perhaps your, your last set of, of comments on those further issues. Yes, sure. It's unlike my old friend Jeffrey Sack to be reticent about speaking <laughs> about a meeting like this. I tried must, to provoke him. gone for a cup of tea. <laughs> um, I, I assume that Laurie's uh, point about simplification of drafting is a, was aimed at me and my, my bill. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously, I agree. Simplification is a very desirable thing in, in leg legislation. But on the other hand... Um, and, and it's also a fact, of course, that, that labour law is some of the most complex uh, provisions in, that you can find on the statute book in any country other than perhaps France. But uh, I mean, the complexity of, of the, some of the legislation that we've got on trade unions is, is legendary, even amongst the judiciary. But the, the, this bill, I... I I and mean, I was helped by um, a lot of uh, co colleagues, Keith Ewing, Nicola Contouris, Mark Friedland, uh, in the drafting of this. We tried to keep it as simple as we possibly could. Uh, and even then, we're well aware that there are grey areas at the edges, which will be left for judicial uh, discretion, ultimately. And, and that depends on the politics and the desires of the particular judges the ca cases are going to uh, come before. But, um, I mean, obviously the legislation has got to block off as many loopholes as it possibly can, knowing that that is the history uh, of, of what's happened to previous legislation on the status of, uh, of, of workers. Employers have always sought their way around it. So, Simplification is a, is a good guide guideline, but on the other hand, you've got to be very, very careful that you block off every conceivable avenue of escape for the uh, employers, um, the employers' uh, uh, lawyers. I think, uh, and, and really, this leads into Winnie's point, the about the regulation of uh, Uber and so on. We we had a judgment on the Uber case in the Supreme Court here a year ago uh, 
Um, and that's well, well worth studying because one of the principles, what the Supreme Court held was not that Uber drivers were employees, but they were this intermediate British category of a limby worker which was close enough. Now, apparently Uber are trying to find ways around that by redesigning their contracts. But the point I was gonna make was that in the leading judgment from Lord Leggett, uh, he, he uh, uh, um, made it uh, a, or declared that the principle was uh, not to construe the contracts, but to construe the purpose of the legislation. And that as a sort of governing principle is absolutely essential in this area of the law. Um, it's not just a purposive uh, a construction of the legislation, it's that the legislation is more important than the uh, contract. I don't do justice to his words, but it, it repays um, uh, study. Um, and I think the final point that I wanted to make was just to endorse something that Darcy said uh, when he spoke at length earlier, which is, uh, which touches on, um, on Winnie's points about cases not coming forward in various areas. The problem with, with all this, of course, is enforcement. And there's only two ways or three ways of it, uh, that these laws are enforced. One is by the worker who, who may find it very difficult both to understand the law or to have the resources to have somebody with her who can understand the law and explain it to the uh, court tribunal committee or whatever it is. Uh, that's the first way. Uh, and most workers just give up. I mean, they just you know, um, they, they, they just don't pursue their rights, so their the rights are, are laid waste to. The second way, of course, is by some agency of the state. Well, we do have that in respect of some labour laws. We've got a health and safety executive that's meant to uh, pursue health and safety cases, and Her Majesty's Revenue and customs is meant to pursue breaches of the national minimum wage but of course these state agencies are starved of resources they got far too much on their plate and they are not a they are not doing the job of making sure that that employers comply with their legal requirements and the third way of course is through trade unions and this to my mind is is the real way forward it's got to be trade unions that enforce this law either by collective bargaining or through litigation or or both which means that uh, more workers have got to join uh, trade unions and trade unions are going to become more active in understanding the areas where they can be effective in enforcing the law. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much, John. Are there any uh, further uh, hands that want to be shown? <laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks very much, John, for, for what has been a really um, wonderful presentation. And uh, certainly what I'd hoped is that um, you would give us a sense and it would trigger debate and questions and um, thanks very much for that. It certainly has served our purposes. Uh, just to indicate to the participants that uh, John in fact mentioned his name, the next speaker is Nicola Contouris who will um, talk on, on the European experience and, and look at um, in fact hopefully some more concrete and positive examples of regulatory development in, in some European countries. And then the, the next seminar after that will be, we, we've um, got hold of a prominent American scholar who will talk about in particular the, the California experience around regulation of, of Uber, which will be on the 25th. Um, and we'll, we'll send an invite for that. So once again, thanks very much, John, and thanks everybody for participating and um, good evening, everybody. Thanks, ciao.